Hey everyone, we're going to wrap up our chapter on air masses and fronts and look here at severe storms in regards to uh, thunderstorms, tornadoes, and um, hurricanes as well. So just a quick review, remember, because due to the nature of where North America is and the air masses coming towards the central part of the country, the, you have these fronts. And fronts, are again, remember, you have the maritime, you have the polar air, you have all these different types of uh, humid humidity and temperature that you're, the fronts are going to be the result of this severe weather. It's also important to note out that um, you get different patterns coming your way depending on the season. So you can see we'll use Vegas just because we're here. Most of our maritime tropical, um, again, we have the mountains there blocking that kind of makes up for something different, but makes sense why continental polar summer or winters here are cold and uh, dry. And then you have the most storms and things of that nature. And here's the thunderstorms coming through this summer. So we're going to look closer at the mid-latitude cyclones. And it's important to note that it's when you have a very cold, dry air uh, colliding with the maritime tropical, so humid and warm. And it's going to go, they're going to be going in opposite directions. So it usually starts out then as a stationary front. We're going to see how it matures as the storm develops. And we're going to see that the as the front start begins, it's going to take this wave shape, which we'll see here in a second. And it's important to note that you're going to have this counterclockwise circulation, that uh, low front moving the uh, two different fronts, the cold and the warm. And it's going to form that cyclonic circulation because you have cold air is going to catch up to the warm air. The cold air is heavier, but it's also going to be moving much faster, usually getting that occluded front, which we already learned about. And what will eventually happen is this pressure gradient, the high to the low, will weaken. You'll get equilibrium, and the storm or the fronts will usually just diminish. So here it is all put together. Here we have our uh, stationary front, warm and cold air. We talked about how the, the wave develops. You're going to see kind of that initial counterclockwise rotation. And here comes that cold air. Remember, the cold air is much faster. So it starts to catch up to the warm. And as a result, you have this, if we look in the bottom left, this circulation is starting to develop. And that circulation is going to be the result of the inclement weather in different areas. And then as we mentioned, what will eventually happen is that cyclone dissipates. So you can see it; they move from a west to east of the United States. And again, it usually takes days to uh, finally for that whole front weather system to end. So here, as we just discussed and we saw in the... Diagram, so they are moving from a west to east motion. You'll see uh, different clouds in the sky, which we've already discussed when looking at when different fronts come in, whether it be a cold front or a warm front. And again, about two to four days for these to pass. Uh, you've experienced this before. When a storm comes through, usually you have inclement weather, wind before the rain, and then finally the thunderstorm. And then as it leaves the area, you get the... Uh, characteristics of whether whatever front is coming through important to note these are largest in the spring you'll see in the midwest and east coast they usually get large thunderstorms and also uh, tornadoes which we'll talk about here in a second it's just through that unequal heating finally the northern hemisphere as we all know is starting to get more direct sunlight starting to heat up still mixing with that cold weather from winter that's sticking around which results in usually the most violent storms happening and you're going to get different weather based on which front is coming in. If we look at the warm front in this case, what we have is uh, lower, thicker clouds. Remember, the warm air does is much lighter, cannot push that cold air out of the way as well as vice versa. So you have light precipitation, but it's going to usually last quite a long time. So looking at this, here's you got your different cloud characteristics and you can also know what's coming through based on the clouds. So if it's cirrus to cirrus stratus, you can see you're starting with high clouds and eventually low clouds, and then you get your moderate precipitation. Whereas it's a little different when a cold front comes in, that cold, heavy air 
pushes that warm air up quite quickly, resulting in the high updraft or very large updraft, I should say, creating those cumulonimbus clouds. They usually rush in. You'll have that storm maybe for a couple hours and they'll rush out. And as expected, as it passes through, you're gonna temperature are gonna drop because you're gonna be stuck with that cold air that uh, moved all the warm air out. Okay, looking at this, this gives you a great idea of again how large these low pressure systems can be. Here we have the the cold front is catching up to the warm front. Starts always at the middle or near the low pressure. Then eventually the tail will come and get that warm air. But if we do a couple cross sections, you have G to F here. Looking up at the top, you can see it's just steady air that we have kind of an occluded front here. You just have cold air, all right, warm air sitting on top of cold air, re re resulting in this these nimbo stratus clouds. So just a steady rain. Whereas we look down here from E to A, one just note how how large this is. We're looking somewhere probably in central Texas or Oklahoma, and going all the way to the east coast. So here we are looking at down here. So again. Oklahoma, Texas, all the way to the East Coast, you have all these different air patterns going on. Then here you have almost something similar we saw. We were looking at the storm almost increasing that way. All right, now we're going to look at some of the weather that these low, low pressure systems are producing. Something we're all familiar with is thunderstorms. We already know that cumulonimbus are the very violent. We're going to have that heavy rain and lightning. And then usually sometimes, I shouldn't say usually, sometimes a lar uh, occasional hail. About 2,000 at any given time on Earth. We have about 100,000 per year in the Gulf Coast, especially Florida, is where this is happening quite often. And again, this gives you an idea we're looking at number of days with thunderstorms. So again, Florida, almost a third of the year, they're getting a thunderstorm. And remember, these are, uh, they don't last very long. We look closer to home or, you know, depends on our monsoon season. So this just gives you an idea and it makes sense why a majority of them, again, are in the central part of the country. Cold air coming down, warm, moist air coming up. That's where you have the interaction. So there's different stages of development. What we're going to need is we're going to need warm, moist air, and you're going to need that instability. You're going to need the lifting, so areas of low pressure. Um, high surface temperatures, remember, results in radiation, warm air increasing, and that's why they're happening usually in the afternoon and early evening. So how it starts out, we just have this again, that warm air rising. As it rises, it cools, cr uh, creating clouds. Those clouds get build up all that moisture, eventually they get too heavy where they fall, where we call that the active stage. That's where, again, you get most of the action, the winds, the hail, the heavy precip. And then when it's all said and done, that's you have this cooling effect. Um, you, I'm sure you've all experienced after the storm, and you, you really notice the temperatures have changed drastically. It's because that cooling effect of the precipitation. So here it is what we just discussed again, that updraft creating a cumulus cloud, which isn't too uh, violent, but then as it keeps increasing, that air keeps increasing, the cloud gets heavy and heavy, it has to dissipate the rain, and fi finally it just empties all out. A little sidebar in regards to lightning, all you have is a combination of air is moving up and down in the cloud really rapidly, and almost imagine how sometimes if you rub your feet on the carpet and you touch a doorknob, you get that shock. What's going on in the cloud, it's creating a regions of negative and positive in different parts of the cloud, negative at the bottom and positive at the top. And what the ground is giving off, the surface of the earth is giving off a positive charge. And these negative ions are looking for, they want to be neutral. So and that's you, a good spot is usually the ground. So that results in lightning. Sometimes you'll see cloud to cloud. That's when we have the high positive ions finding the negative ions in the uh, uh, cumulonimbus cloud nearby. Tornadoes, as you all know, are just these violent windstorms of circulation coming from a cumulonimbus cloud and storms. You have that low pressure causing the air to rush into the uh, tornado, resulting in these very, very fast winds, and then also the suction that you get from these stronger um, tornadoes. You got about 770 per year. They're mostly happening through April and June. Remember, that's when we usually have the severe storms like we mentioned earlier in the lecture. 
and it's not really known. We believe it has something to do with the air coming off the Rocky Mountains flowing east, mixing with those two fronts that are meeting in the central United States. But they do form a long cold front during the spring, and we it's usually do those supercells. Supercells are just these thunderstorms essentially on steroids, the massive storms just coming through the Midwest and central uh, United States. Good overview of what we just discussed. This shows you where most of the um, tornadoes occur. Again, central United States, I think it has something to do with the air coming off the Rockies, and then even tornado days. So again, it's happening a majority of the time in um, the spring. So in order to find a tornado or forecast or predict when a, if a tornado is going to come, it's very difficult because they're not very big. You could be, you'll see areas where one house is destroyed and literally across the street the house is standing. So what they do is they do a couple things. If conditions are looking like it's going to happen, they call it a tornado watch. And then a tornado warning is when we actually see one that has touched the ground. So again, the potential's there. Norm, go about your normal activities, but then a warning is when you really got to get inside. And finally, how we categorize tornadoes is based on wind speed and the damage. So you can see in F0, you have wind speeds at over uh, under 116 kilometers per hour, and then it increases to an F5 and giving you the damage as well. Moving on to hurricanes. Um, most violent storms on Earth, in order to be called a hurricane, it has to reach a certain 74 miles per hour in regards to wind, and you're going to see in a second how they rotate there. Where they're occurring is between the latitudes of 5 and 20 degrees, and you can see the ones we experience are on the East Coast. It's resulting in this warm air coming off the uh, coast of western coast of Africa, picking up moisture in the Atlantic Ocean, and then as it uh, curls up northward, it um, goes towards our eastern seaboard, and then sometimes they'll even get in through the Gulf of Mexico. So depending on where you live, they're called different things. We call them hurricanes, obviously. Typhoons, if in your western Pacific, cyclones in the Indian Ocean. Um, north Pacific has actually the most, so you'll hear typhoons. And there's different parts. We're, Eye wall, what's happening, that's near the center. Air is rising incredibly fast. And as a result, you just get this wall of cumulonimbus clouds, so storm clouds, and also in the eyes where you have these greatest wind speeds and where most majority of the rain is going to fall. So it should be no surprise the eye of the hurricane's at the very center. It's only about 12 and a half miles of diameter. You'll see images in a second of how large these hurricanes are. And then what will happen is as it passes through, it's going to slowly subside. So just a closer look at how we a hurricane develops. Remember, the ones we experience are off the coast of Africa. You have this warm air gaining moisture, resulting in um, air lifting, rising, forming those cumulonimbus clouds, and warm oceans just keep fueling these things. So as oceans get warmer and warmer, you're going to see larger and larger hurricanes. And the diagram, again, notice that cyclonic flow going up. You have the eye, the high pressure in the center sinking. Surrounding the outflow, you have those spiral arms that are the cumulonimbus. So just a massive amounts of wind energy and uh, rain occurring from these storms. And what meteorologists will do when they're looking at a uh, hurricane, where it's headed, how strong it's going to be, they're looking at the pressure. And to give you an idea here, remember low pressure usually means uh, bad weather. In regards to a hurricane, the pressure drops incredibly. And as a result, that is what happens in regards to why these storms are so uh, strong and massive. So eventually all hurricanes will diminish. It's based on the cooler. They need to, Usually when they hit land, temperatures will drop. Cooler ocean waters in the North Atlantic cause them to lose their power. And again, but some, they will also, depending on how, they, how much energy they gained in the Gulf of Mexico or in the South Atlantic, they could ride up the whole eastern seaboard like we saw 
a few years ago with Superstorm Sandy going all the way up to New York. Two things when we classify a hurricane, what they're looking at is the strength of the storm in regards to you're going to see wind speeds. Um, looking at where it's going, is it a highly populated area? And then even looking how the the shape of the ocean is affected near shore. And at the end, we come up with this Saffir-Simpson scale. So looking here at the Saffir-Simpson scale, again, we're looking at wind speeds, but then we're also going to see storm surges as well. Storm surges are how much water from the ocean is moving inland due to the high winds that the hurricane is producing. So looking closer at our storm surge, it's just, again, a massive amount of water due to the wind kicked up by the hurricane. And what you're going to get is a, a lot of inland f flooding and torrential uh, rains. It's a closer look here at the storm surge. So if the storm is moving from left to right, that wind is going left to right. So you can see how the wind-driven surge, how much it rises off the ocean, and that's what's going to end up inland. So just a fun fact, people always kind of ask on how they come up with these names, but um, what it is is the uh, NOAA. They um, have a National Hurricane Center, and they aren't really too into naming the hurricanes. Instead, we have this World Meteor Meteorological Organization. So what they do is for the Atlantic hurricanes, the one that affects the United States, there's this list of male and female names. You can see that it, it'll, it'll go male, female, go every other, and they're used on a six-year rotation. So um, looking here, here are the names that will go through for six years. So this year, you know, it'll be Arlene and then so on. And then 2018, they'll pick up with the uh, names used in 2012. All right, so that's it. That's our chapter on air masses, fronts, severe weather. As always, if you have anything, any questions, you know where to find me.